What's up everyone? I was recently able to see the new Ghostbusters this weekend and I wanted to give my thoughts on the movie. So if you haven't seen it, there will be spoilers in this review. So go check it out and come back and watch the review. And with that, let's get to it. Now I'm a huge fan of the original Ghostbusters. I watched the movies a ton as a kid and even watched a Saturday morning TV show when it aired. The movies are all time classics with an all star cast consisting of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, Ernie Hudson, Sigourney Weaver, and Rick Moranis. Now the original Ghostbusters was released in 1984 and Ghostbusters 2 was released in 1989 and both were boxed off the hit. So naturally fans thought there'd probably be another one along the way, right? Well, that never happened. We actually found out later that Dan Aykroyd said he had written a script for Ghostbusters 3, but it was sitting in development hell and wasn't made and actually sat there for over 25 years. And then with the untimely passing of Harold Ramis who played Egon Spengler, I figured the sequel would never happen, as did most Ghostbusters fans. Until recently, we got the news that there was going to be a new Ghostbusters movie with the original cast. Now, there was a Ghostbusters movie released in 2016, but this was considered a reboot. And at the time, I figured it's something that needs to be done. And it actually had a change of pace and a different lookout of the Ghostbusters franchise, as everybody in the cast was female, which I thought was a pretty cool thing to do. The movie itself was okay. It was decent, and it was an okay adaptation of what the original Ghostbusters were. But most die card hardcore fans wanted a Ghostbusters with the original cast. And again, I still didn't understand how they were going to do it because Harold Ramis had passed. Now Harold Ramis is a comedic genius. He's written many many movies as far as back to school screenplay. He's done the Meatballs movie. He's done Groundhog Day. And he actually helped Dan Aykroyd write the story for Ghostbusters even though Dan Aykroyd put a little more into it than he did. But the character of Egon was molded as what Harold Ramis wanted him to be. So he was an influential part, not just as a character, but in the creation of Ghostbusters. And again, how are you going to replace him? And then as more and more things were coming out, we learned that the original cast will be coming back. But in what capacity? We knew Dan Acker was coming back. He's been trying to get Ghostbusters made for the past 30 years and Ernie Hudson was on board. The main person that we always thought would be kind of hard to get on board was Bill Murray. And he actually agreed to come back as Peter Venkman, not another character like he did in 2016. Well, the thing that always stuck out to me about the movie was Bill Murray actually said in an interview that he felt it was the best movie to come back to as Peter Venkman as he thought the script was very well written. And the story was even better. So after hearing Bill Murray's comments, my hopes and expectations went up. And I was actually really excited to see the new adaptation and see how they were going to take the story. The opening scene put to bed any doubts that I had about the movie, to be honest. I loved the way it was shot with the proton pack going off. We hear the nostalgic sound of it going off. So we know a Ghostbuster is there. We see the chase scene through the cornfield up to a scary looking house. We see the trap being dangled as a way to get the ghost to be enticed. And we see the person holding the trap, not his face, but we see his silhouette and we know it's Egon. We can tell by his hair, we see his glasses in the shadows. And fun fact is Egon was actually played by Bob Gooden, who is the warden from the Shawshank Redemption. And I thought he played it very well without having any lines or dialogue in him. I really love the way it's shot, the way he runs into the house and pulls out one of the paranormal readers that the Ghostbusters used to use. And it's just beautifully shot with a dim light and it's like you're seeing Egon in his last moments. And before he perishes, Egon actually places the trap and what we find out later is the floorboard. Cutting to more recent times, maybe a week later, we find Egon's daughter, Callie played by Carrie Coon and her two kids, Trevor played by Finn Wolfhard and Phoebe, played by McKenna Grace. We can already see that Phoebe actually is a dead ringer for her grandpa as she loves science and kind of has some resemblance to Egon. We also find that Egon is actually 
abandoned his family. Him and Callie had no real relationship, and we later find out about his relationship with the rest of the Ghostbusters. Now, the background on Callie is kind of cliche to me, a struggling mom with two kids that's living week to week. Now, it is relatable, especially in this time of the pandemic. I just thought it was a little cliche in terms of Hollywood. We find out that Egon actually left his house to his daughter, and the house we're talking about is the one we saw in the beginning of the movie. This house is located in Somerville, Ohio, which is a very rural area. And Egon, as we find out, was known as the dirt farmer. He didn't speak to anybody, but he continuously worked on his farm. The house they inherit is a dump. But we do get a cool cameo of a real caring character, Janine, who is played by Annie Potts, who is actually from the original Ghostbusters and was a secretary to all the Ghostbusters in the first two movies and love interest of Lewis. She tells him that she's been handling Egon's affairs and he, Egon basically left a lot of debt to his daughter and he was pretty much broke. Well, as the kids begin to settle in at their new job and as school, Phoebe is actually led to the trap and the floorboards by a ghost. And we all assume this ghost is Egon. And this is one of the aspects of the movie I really enjoyed because there were no words used for the character. Everything was all visual. There wasn't even silhouettes or CGI shown for it. It was mostly practical effects of lights moving, lights turning on, things pushing here to there that actually made it more intense and actually seemed to fit the narrative of the movie better. I really preferred this aspect to using a voice-in or a stand-in. I did like the stand-in in the beginning of the movie, but I prefer it more practical this way with the ghost not being saying anything, just kind of moving things around. And he shows Phoebe where the trap is, which he does, uncovers, and brings it to school to show her substitute teacher, Gary Guberson. Now, Gary Guberson has a lot of features or attributes of Lewis, in my opinion. He's nerdy and he's really smart. He's also very awkward as well, but he is a big fan of the Ghostbusters as he grew up around that time. And when he sees a trap, he's astounded and, uh, and so excited to open it. When they open it, they let out a spirit that goes into a abandoned mine. We later learn in the movie as we get going the story that the abandoned mines actually was uncovered by miners. These miners uncovered Sumerian artifacts and Sumerian statues and as told by Phoebe's friend podcast these miners actually committed suicide jumping into the mine and nobody knows why and this is one of the aspects of the movie that I actually really liked again the throwback the continuous falling back on the older material and elaborating on it we learned that evil Shadner actually created these places within the town he actually built a town from the ground up who was Evil Shradner? Well, he's actually the person that built the Manhattan building for Gozer. So now everything falls into place. And it also explains why Egon moved there. And that is further even explained when the kids actually see Muncher, a ghost that resembles Slimer, who eats metal. And Phoebe and Podcast try to shoot it with the proton pack, which they catch. And eventually end up chasing it throughout the street in the Ecto-1, which was repaired by Trevor. Now, the Ecto-1 scene prior, I really liked, was that they would give you little tidbits of views of it. They never actually shown it until he actually drove it off. But the whole fact that he was fixing it, the looking at the logo and then his phone goes out, it was giving you like anticipation, building it up and up to get you to see it and want to see it. And as a fan, of course, you want to see it. The nostalgia was hitting like crazy. This movie has a lot of throwbacks to the Ghostbusters universe. During the Munchers chase scene, there's actually the scene with the gunner seat and the Ecto-1. That wasn't in the original Ghostbusters movies, but it actually was a big predominant part in the Ghostbusters cartoon. The elaborate story of Yvonne Shabler, or elaborating on that story, we learned that he did build the building in Manhattan, which first brought Gozer here. But we also learned that he built the town of Somerville and is setting up another place for Gozer to appear. He actually makes a cameo in the movie as well, played by J.K. Rawlings. But his scene is so short, it's actually pretty funny what happens to him. So if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. 
but that aspect of Ivan Chandler is actually an aspect that was mostly expanded in the 2009 release of the Ghostbusters video game. And I love the fact that Jason Ritman actually included all these things because it's bringing the universe together as one. Another part that I actually liked was the chase scene from Paul Rudd and the Keymaster. Now, before he's chased by the Keymaster, Paul Rudd is actually looking at and astonished by the appearance of the State Puff Marshmallow Man, but in miniature form, who eventually attacks him to where he then stumbles upon the Keymaster. And the Keymaster is better looking in this movie, of course, this 30 years later. But the chase scene is almost resembles the same scene with Lewis or Rick Moranis in the original. He's chased through the Walmart, and as he gets outside, we have that similar look of when he breaks through the glass, just as it did with Lewis when the beast actually broke through the windows to get him. And I really liked that, and it was like a little homage to the original. And it's something that real big fans or nerds like myself will kind of pick up as Easter eggs that the director threw in there for us. And that's something that I really enjoyed because you're paying tribute or homage to the original movie that all of us fell in love with. As the movie progresses, we find that we have more and more character development with Trevor and his girlfriend, Lucky Domingo, whose dad is a sheriff. And we also learn why Ray was actually mad or the Ghostbusters were mad at Egon. As Ray explains in the phone call that Egon basically took all their gear and left and then eventually phoned 10 years later saying that the apocalypse was coming. We later learned that Egon was correct. The apocalypse was coming and he was actually trying to prevent it by having all their gear proton packs shoot down the spirits of Gozer and her dominions. The last thing I want to touch on is actually the ending. Now, the ending to me was actually really well written and really well shot in terms of what the anticipation of what was going to happen. You did feel some disappointment at first because you didn't believe the original cast was going to come except for the cameo by Ray earlier in the movie. But eventually when trouble seems down, all three of the original Ghostbusters appear. Peter Venkman, Winston, and the Ray stands. They appear to help out the new Ghostbusters or the kids, Phoebe, Trevor, Podcast, and Lucky against the Sumerian god Gozer, who I thought was very well done and the voice was actually great. And the interaction between her and the original Ghostbusters was pretty funny, especially when she asked Ray if he was a god. Little things like that are what get the nerds like me really excited or happy. The whole scene was shot perfectly in my opinion. I did find it a little weird with Egon coming back as CGI, but again, there was no word spoken and I really liked that aspect that he was speechless but he mostly showed through his emotions and actions um, visually what he wanted to express and I thought that was really done well and there was no need to have a voiceover person or somebody to replace Harold Ramis in that terms and it actually was a silhouette and actually a CGI of Harold Ramis used which I thought was kind of cool I don't know if it was Bob Guten that actually sat in for the silhouette, I'm assuming it was, and they just put Harold Ramis' face on him, but it was shot pretty well. I did like that uh, they had the three ghost specials come together, and at the end of the movie, we see that there's possibly a sequel in the mix. So, depending on how well this movie does, and as of right now, it has already made $66 million for a $75 million budget after one weekend, so it's possibly that a sequel could be coming in place. We have to just wait on it. Now, going into it, as I said, I was skeptical. I didn't expect it to be a great movie, and I'm not saying it's an Oscar-winning movie. It was enjoyable. One thing I don't get is all the negative criticism of modern-day critics saying the movie is a lot of fan service. Well, it's not about a franchise with the original cast that hasn't been made in 35 years, so I'm assuming there's going to be some fan service there. And fan service sells whether we like it or not, especially when it's done in a tasteful way. And this movie actually does it in a tasteful way. It's just not recycled things. It's mostly elaborations on things that were already established in the previous movies. If you're a fan of the original series, I'm pretty sure you would like this movie as well. And if you're not a fan, for example, my wife, 
she knew of the first two movies, but she wasn't a hardcore fan like me, and she actually came out of the movie liking it a lot. And I think this movie actually opens the doors for new fans to come in and also want to go back and watch the original movie. She actually talked about watching them this weekend. So I think that's another thing that's good. You can see the originals of what they wore and come back into full circle with this movie. Now, we know there probably will be sequels. Will the original cast of the original Ghostbusters of again reappear? Maybe. It's hinted, but you never know. But this movie did its purpose and actually made the Ghostbusters sequel tastefully and enjoyable. And that's all you can ask for. Well, I've been rambling on for about 16 minutes. And I can ramble about Ghostbusters all day. I love talking movies and whatnot, as you guys probably know. But with that, thank you so much for listening and putting up with this long review. I hope you enjoy the movie as much as I do. As always, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.